So Susie will be interviewing Chevron from um, the Disability Advocacy Network Australia about the federal government's official response to the Disability Royal Commission. We'll provide you an update on the amendments to the bill and changes and how these will affect you. Um, we'll do a meet and greet because some of our advocacy advisory um, group members are actually with us at this meeting today. So we will introduce them to you and in our feedback loop, we'll also be talking about some, giving you some information about the task force as well. Thank you, Gordana. Um, so I guess, you know, as you know, last year, um, the Disability Royal Commission um, final report was released. There were 222 recommendations. And then last month we had our response, our much awaited response from the federal and state governments. Um, at a federal level, you know, only 13 recommendations were accepted in full. Um, New South Wales, there were nine. Um, and it felt, I mean, for anyone who was watching, I've seen a few names come up of people who are very, have been very engaged in this process. For anyone who was watching, who was involved, it felt a bit like, really? You know, that's it? We're just getting these 13. Um, that's all you're going to, you know, that's all you're going to respond to. Now, the government says, and I, I was involved in a meeting with um, the New South Wales Minister, uh, Mr. Minister Washington last week, the government says, look, it's not just that we're only accepting the, the 13, um, you know, things that were accepted in principle are just things we want to consult further on. Um, we want to maybe consult with people with disability or representative organisations. Um, and so I guess for my perspective, I'm still feeling a bit disappointed and I'm guessing some of you guys are too. Um, but there's still hope that we can continue to advocate, continue to push. And I think that's what, what's really important. You know, SCIA has always advocated for our members and for the needs of our members um, and will continue to do that. Um, and so what we wanted to do is invite Siobhan, who is a specialist in um, the Disability Royal Commission. I think that's your policy area of expertise, Siobhan. Um, and do we can't do all 222 or you'll be here all night so what i did was i picked out i think five or six um, of the recommendations and responses that i think really impact our members um and that you'll be interested to hear about um and so i thought i'd do a bit of a you know like like sbs inside or something a bit of a q a with siobhan um to get her expert knowledge so um, I'll introduce Siobhan um, now. Thank you so much for coming along to share um, your knowledge with us and to be involved in our forum. Um, and even though it's mostly about Disability Royal Commission, I thought I'd just ask you first, you know, who is Dana? Um, it's a lot easier we all say Dana instead of Disability Advocacy Network Australia. So who is Dana? What are your focus areas? Um, and if we're interested in what we see, how can we get involved? Brilliant. Thank you, Susie, and thanks for having me along today. Hi, everyone here. And um, yeah, this looks like a fantastic forum. Apologies that I can't stay for the whole event today as we have another virtual forum I need to rush off to shortly. Uh, DANA is the national representative body for a network of independent disability advocacy organisations throughout Australia. SCIA has been one of our member organisations for a number of years. Um, our staff come from all over. I'm one of the policy officers. I work from home on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, as part of our organisation, we have the policy and advocacy team that I am a part of, um, and uh, also the NCDA team, which do lots of sector development and training work um, for organisations like uh, SCIA that are um, in part of the National Disability Advocacy Program. Uh, and yeah, we've been expanding quite a, a lot, um, but essentially we still have this same, you know, core purposes of strengthening, supporting and providing a collective voice for independent disability advocacy organisations across Australia. Um, and yeah, promoting the human rights, needs, value and diversity of people with disability. Um, if you would like to get involved, um, I have posted some links to the in the chat um, as along with some others that are of things that I'll mention throughout uh, this Q&A. Um, there's also you can sign up to our monthly bulletin, uh, follow us on social media and look out for future campaigns like the Speak Up uh, campaign that we we've done to uh, 
yeah, underline the importance of funding for independent advocacy. Thanks, Susie. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, so we can, we've got the, the links in the chat. Um, Gordana can also send them out when she sends out um, the link to this, the forum that she puts online. Um, so that if you, you know, you're interested in some of the things Siobhan shares with us today, you can get involved um, with Dana as well as SCIA. Um, so the first question that I have is about its recommendation 5.2 for anyone who knows all the 222 recommendations by heart um, but I'll read it just in case you don't um, and I've got I'm looking at my other screen while I read it the federal and state government state the federal and state and local governments have committed to review Australia's disability policy a strategy sorry which was to run from 21 to, to 31 so we're right at the beginning of that disability strategy um, to ensure that it reflects the issues that were outlined in the Royal Commission. It includes targeted action plans. So one of the things we've been talking a lot about is, you know, let's build in some accountability. You know, when are you going to get this stuff done? So it includes targeted action plans um, and outcomes framework, guiding principles, um, a data improvement plan, lots of big words that what does it mean kind of thing. Um, so the commission recommended that this be done with people with disability and their representative organisations. So I think, oh, well, that's got to be us, right? Um, but apparently this will be done with Australia's Disability Strategy Advisory Council. So I guess for you, Siobhan, who is across this, who is Australia's Disability Strategy Advisory Council? How are they selected? Do you guys, are you guys part of this? Um, and how can we, our members, the people on this, um, in this forum, contribute to make sure that the needs of people with spinal cord injury, other neurological conditions are addressed? Mm. Yeah, so uh, firstly, um, Dana doesn't have a formal relationship with the council, but what it is is um, you can find the link in the chat. Um, yep. If there's uh, 12 positions, which includes the, the chair and core members, core members who are all people with disability, and then there's four rotating state and territory disability council representatives, which can, um, and two special advisors, which can, um, can be people with or without disability. And the current chair is Jane Spring AM from the Disability Council of New South Wales. Uh, core members are appointed for a period of up to three years, state and territory representatives. And I think some have been appointed this year for a period up to 15 months. Um, uh, and though, yeah, we don't have a formal relationship with them, I note that several of the advisory council members are connected with disability advocacy and representative organisations, uh, such as member organisations of DANA, like uh, Youth Disability Advocacy Service here in Melbourne, um, ADACAS in Canberra or QDN in Queensland and yeah. also fellow national yeah. organisations like FPDN, yeah. First Peoples Disability Network um, and Women with Disabilities Australia. Uh, yeah, in terms of getting involved, um, the Department of Social Services has recently um, had a focused review of the ADS releasing a discussion paper which identified some of the key issues with account, you know, as you mentioned, with accountability, implementation, compliance under the strategy. Um, so Dana both endorsed um, a submission written by People with Disability Australia and also sent in a letter with some additional recommendations, um, including that governments invest in developing disability leadership, self-advocacy, representation and participation through secure ongoing funding for organisations like SCIA um, and many of the other kind of peer support advocacy organisations around the place. Um, we've also highlighted, you know, that planning for the effects of climate change on people with disabilities should be properly in, integrated into the um, ADS, um, including through the targeted action plans. Um, so this consultation is now closed in the last couple of weeks, um, and it was only a fairly short process. Um, uh, but yeah, I think Dana, along 
as one of the disability representative organizations, along with the the people on the advisory council were sort of consulted with um, draft versions of the discussion paper that was then, you know, still in draft form um, during the consultation. Um, and yeah, it's hoped that this will lead to improvements. We, we did find the recommendations and findings fairly accurate as to identifying the problems of, um, you know, that the ADS has largely sort of not really driven progress. Um, there is also, as part of the existing kind of uh, commitments under the under the strategy, um, uh, there's going to be an independent major evaluation starting sometime next year, um, probably later, 2025-26, it's meant to be completed. So that we think really needs to be informed by the expertise of disability advocacy representative and peer support organizations about like how to meaningfully include people in evaluation processes that are accessible. So that will be a chance for people to have their say. There'll be some form of, you know, public consultation and hopefully, you know, really accessible varied forms of ways to, yeah, raise how the ADS can be better for diverse disability types, including spinal cord injuries and other neuro conditions. Okay, and we'll make sure we share any, you know, as Gordana does in her monthly emails, any links to um, consultations for the Australian Disability Strategy as well. My next question is one I'm really passionate about. Um, and so I, I feel like it's recommendation 5.6 um, and it's recommending a Minister for Disability Inclusion responsible for a disability inclusion strategy, policies and programs that are currently under the remit of the Minister for Social Services. So we talk a lot about, you know, basic lack of basic inclusion in, you know, a lot of public facilities. I know, you know, that's a barrier to getting out and about, you know, public toilets, public, like all kinds of things that are inclusion issues that affect um, our membership. Um, and I'm so I'm a big fan of the idea of having a minister for disability inclusion, whose sole purpose is to focus on this. But I know that it was only noted. So in the in the Disability Royal Commission response, you could have, you know, accepted, um, accepted in principle, and then just noted, which is like, whatever, you know, it's, it kind of doesn't feel very strong having something noted. The government sort of says, well, we've got an NDIS minister, and we've got a minister for social services. So we're doing those things. But social services is an enormous portfolio. And the NDIS only covers some people with disabilities. Many of you here today that aren't covered by the NDIS. So from my perspective, a minister that focuses on disability inclusion, like helping make the world more accessible, um, is the mo one of the most important recommendations. And, and I was disappointed to see it noted. So I guess for you, Siobhan, What's Dana's take on this one? Is this something you guys are really annoyed about like me? Um, and, you know, are we going to be able to advocate a bit more for this? Or what have you heard? Why is it only noted? Mm. Yeah, no, it isn't. It's very non-committal and it's really just like not wanting to reject it. I'm, I, I guess I don't have a developed, you know, official Dana position for you here. But personally, I agree. A dedicated minister for disability inclusion is definitely an idea. We should be, you know, that's worth pushing and, you know, that we can perhaps influence, um, you know, future decision making ahead of cabinet reshuffles or or other decision making. Um, though I, I guess I also note that um, looking at state and territory governments, often um, the ministers that have responsibility for disability matters or it's all, often among a portfolio of other mm. of other responsibilities, community or social policy areas, sometimes aged care, sometimes even health. So often that is the, you know, the ministerial um, workload is often, you know, kind of very divided amongst multiple very big policy areas. Um, and suddenly I think we, you know, can all agree that we need really focused attention and good coordination from decision makers across all areas affecting people with disability. Uh, especially given the current pace and volume of change and the need for reform, you know, that needs to be coordinated across many areas of government policy, 
and the different levels of government. Um, for instance, we need really good, uh, we need transport and housing ministers that um, really understand the needs of people with physical and other disability types. Um, and we need leaders who can champion the need for reform, both at ministerial levels and in other commissioner and statutory positions. And definitely, I, I think Dana's, um, you know, the, some of the policy work, and I, I can say that our leadership team, very keen on, you know, strengthening um, frameworks that are, are for oversight, complaints, accountability. Um, you know, there's been various assorted recommendations and it's, it's kind of trying to pull together from all these all these things that have been said about well, what's a model that would work well and what's going to be something that's disability-led and centres disability um, and and focus on achieving outcomes for people with disability. That is a focus that needs to flow through also to all areas of governing. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my response on that one, Susie. Yeah, we've got to skill up everyone, not just one person. The next question is about one of my favourite subjects, um, and that's accessible housing. Um, so recommendation 7.33 says, the Australian government should, collaborating with the state and territory governments, identify people with disability and housing related agreements and planning, including the, including the National Supply and Affordability Council, um, and include people with disability as priority group for housing supply and affordability, and affordability policy advice. So the government accepts this in principle and says, firstly, it recognises the barriers people with disability face in accessing appropriate housing, and that new homes delivered under the National Housing Accord and Housing Australia Future Fund are required to meet the 2022 National Construction Code relating to livable housing design. So you guys will probably know we've got our policy brief on housing on our website now. Um, we're calling very strongly on the New South Wales government um, to adopt these um, livable standards um, because New South Wales is one of the two only states that have not done that. So this is a really big priority for SCIA in New South Wales. Um, Dana is a national organisation, so you're not so much focused on New South Wales um, and their complete lack of action. I put this question to the New South Wales Minister um, last week as well. Um, but overall, for, for you guys in a national framework, what are your priorities to ensure that housing is accessible? Um, what, so, what's Susie, Dana doing I'm, in that space? Who's this? Susie, sorry, it's Sarah here. I've Hi, been Sarah. recently trying to purchase a new house and every house got a little step to get into. So we have mm -hmm. had to buy a portable mm -hmm. ramp. So I, my thing is, like, and I've talked to our real estate agent and I'm hoping a lot more will adopt it. They're $150 to buy. Why are these not available for people like us <laughs> who need to get into places to find somewhere that's might not be 100% perfect, but close enough to. Yeah, yeah. And why is the step there in the first place, to be honest? Yeah, I mean, it has to be in retro, but in the future, we should be building houses that don't have steps at the front door um, that already have those ramps. So have 100%, Sarah. And I should have said, everyone feel free to jump in about, you know, um, we, I don't have to be the only one in the interview you want. Um, you can ask questions as well. So yeah, Sarah, that's, it's such a good point that A, real estate agents could carry that. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, if you haven't looked um, already, our policy briefing on accessible housing for New South Wales is now up on the website. I don't think Anthea is here, but Anthea is a member who helped to draft it. Um, and we'll be having a little campaign meeting about that shortly. So for people who are interested in housing, um, looking at how we can advocate for that collectively and with other organisations as well. Um, to, yeah, that's another thing we could easily ask. We're also asking for accessible information on the real estate database websites because at the moment, if you do a search there, you've probably done one, right? Um, I've done a billion and, you, and <laughs> yeah, it doesn't like come up with anything. Like, yeah, exactly. Oh, well, everywhere, like even all the newer houses, they're built with that, that one little step at the front, which is enough for us to be able to go, oh, God, I can't get in there. Like, yeah. and I didn't even think until we started to look. Um, and like I said, it's a cheap exercise um, for someone to be able to carry around a portable ramp that weighs like not even four kilos. My 10-year-old son can do it. 
um, why, why are we excluded? So that's a big passion with I'm trying to look at. Like, I don't know how other people have done it. Like, it's just. I, I, yeah. I think I can answer that question about the step. The reason the houses have steps is to stop water being blown in under the doors. And so most properties are built like that. Um, and, you know, I've been in properties that don't have the step. And it is can be a problem. I have had water blowing in, so um, I don't know how you get around that. Maybe you could just instead of a step have a have a slope. Yeah. Yeah, I think they've probably got you know the National Construction Code um, has for step free entrance. So I, I feel like there's probably ways. Um, I see that I've got Jane's hand yeah. is also up, um, and then Siobhan. We might throw to Siobhan to answer the question about what Dana's doing. But Jane, if, do you want to? ask your question or comment? Yes, thanks, Susie. Um, Siobhan, I was wondering about, we hear a lot about accessible housing, but um, I worked in local government and there was a lot of discussion on universal housing. So areas of building homes would be included in all new homes. So it would be a home that you could age in place regardless of abilities and disabilities, as well as if there was any accident, you, you sprained your ankle, you could still get about. And homes that were designed for people as they aged or changed, and it would be wider doorways, um, light switches easily to switch on and off and, and um, taps in bathrooms, et cetera, and entrances and not as many steps and all that sort of stuff but I don't hear anything about it anymore and I'm wondering um, what's happening in the universal housing state I did work with a number of planners and um, people who worked in the housing side and they knew about ha universal housing but they didn't have a lot of information about it and it would be something that I've heard is not a big cost to include universal housing principles in new homes. So is there any any talk about that um, for the future? Uh, yes. So um, we've definitely supported here at Dana the, the Building Better Homes campaign, which there's a link to in the chat. Um, she's included some really amazing achievements by accessible housing advocates and experts. You know, universal housing is similarly um, really an overlapping um, topic. Uh, so, uh, yeah, pushing these standards into the National Construction Code and, you know, then the continued work to call out New South Wales and WA for not signing on. Um, housing has been identified as an increasingly big issue in the work of um, disability advocates, so arguably it's always been kind of one of those big uh, barriers there. Um, that's either directly or indirectly related to a lot of the work that individual advocates do. Um, and, you know, with the cost of living, there's an increase in the number of people with disability reporting they're currently at risk of homelessness. And this definition of homelessness includes sleeping rough or couch surfing or in a, inappropriate accommodation or people not being able to find the accessible houses out there because there aren't enough built. Um, so we, uh, yeah, talked about many of the issues experienced, um, in a submission that my colleague Liam mostly put together, um, e to the National Housing and Homelessness Plan. Um, that consultation was run, um, and submitted, uh, October last year, um, the plan itself is expected to be published at some point this year. Others in this group might know more when that's expected to land. Um, the consultation summary report at least did mention disability um, through a range of areas um, and the need for accessible housing. So we'll be watching to see if this flows through to genuine action to prioritise accessibility and, yeah, you know, the, the continued pressure on the New South Wales government and and WA to, to get on board. Um, there was also a draft recommendation in the discussion paper on the ADS recently um, about a new, um, about creating a new targeted action plan focused on inclusive homes and communities. So that might be another avenue to, um, another way to look at 
getting governments to work together on concrete change and to keep the pressure up. Um, and yeah, uh, I've also got in the chat, um, Dana highlighted this as one of our three priorities, housing generally, um, along with advocacy and safeguarding as um, yeah, priorities for um, when the government consulted on this response um, to their to the DRC Rex. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, it's uh, such an important issue, I think. And and have a look at our website and our policy brief because we put a lot of effort into, you know, talking about New South Wales adopting the standards, also mandating um, real estate agents um, using mm. accessibility features in realestate.com and whatever the other yeah. one is. Um, so there's a few recommendations in there. We're going to be talking about how we can advocate for this as an organisation and with other partner organisations. We also made a submission to um, Treasury, New South Wales Treasury, about this um, a couple of months ago, which is on our website as well, to try and get a bit of, um, you know, it's often Treasury who blocks things. Um, so to try and get Treasury to acknowledge that developing, I think to your point, Jane, I think the figure is, don't quote me, it's in the policy brief, $2,500 more per house to be accessible um, to the set to the livable standards. So that the bronze standard, so that silver standard, sorry. Um, so that, you know, there's um, step free entrance, ad accessible bathroom that can, a bathroom that can be adapted, wider, wider doorways, just those five basic features. It's two and a half grand um, that makes such a difference into the future. Um, so whatever that state, like I know this is being recorded, so it might not be two and a half grand, but it's something like that. Um, have a look at the policy brief for, for the exact statistic. It doesn't cost much to make a house accessible. Um, so last question for Siobhan, um, and it's about alternative housing options. Um, so I think some of that, one of the things that bothers me about the um, federal government response, and in fact, the New South Wales government spot response to the Disability Royal Commission recommendations, is that there's not much in terms of timelines. Um, and so part of, thing, part of this thinking is, how do we keep the government accountable? Um, so this is about alternative housing models um, and the call for innovation through the NDIA. So I talk a lot to people who are interested in, um, who live in as, um, SIL accommodation, um, so in supported independent living or specialist disability accommodation, who would like innovative options, the use of AT to maybe minimise the need for um, care workers and support workers that to enable independence. Um, and this was one of the recommendations to to have in, you know, innovation in this area. And the government sort of said, yes, well, we accept this in principle um, and we'll consider it alongside the NDIS review. Um, so I get it. There's a lot of reviews. We're going to be talking about the NDIS review and the implications of that later on in this meeting. Um, but when we all need to work together, but how can we keep this really important innovation conversation about using accessible technology um, and having innovative models for um, S supported independent living and specialist disability accommodation on the agenda um, for the government? Yeah, look, absolutely, Susie. I think that's a recurrent theme that keeps coming up that, that you know, a lot of advocacy and representative organisations are, are struggling with at the moment is is just the uncertainty that we're navigating, um, making you know more challenging as governments point to oh things are in flux and we need to do things one before another, and it's really hard to interrogate that and get a hold of what isn't being followed through on and what exactly we should be pushing for. Um, so I agree, it's it's a disappointing response to a multifaceted recommendation with the response providing almost no deal, detail on what government is planning in this area and kind of kicking the can along the road, arguably. Um, though they do restate commitment to continue to work um, on this, as, and um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, the targeted action plan, action plan on inclusive housing uh, inclusive homes and communities might be one avenue to push for for innovation and more diverse models incorporating assistive technology. Um, I've also noted another subsection of this recommendation includes a mention of independent advocacy in the context um, of supporting people to understand and explore other housing options 
um, at Dana, we think independent advocacy um, organisations can help really uh, have all the expertise and the knowledge and, you know, the skills to help manage these processes and transitions um, and, you know, support people with disability really well through this kind of process. But we also know that the capacity of the sector at current funding levels means that advocacy organisations often need to prioritise other like urgent crisis work um, where there's an immediate risk to someone's safety over this kind of more proactive, educative, developmental, safeguarding, capacity building work. So um, I guess, uh, yeah, uh, one of the links I put in the chat is really that argument that we need, the, the DRC sees all these roles for advocacy, well, then we need funding for it because like there's recognition that advocates are really important, but there need to be more of them to do the work that needs to be done. Um, so, uh, and just, yeah, lastly on this, I mean, I think building alliances and um, working together is always really important. Um, I note that Summer Foundation has an annual forum coming up. Um, that is focused on the topic of innovation. So I've put a link to that as well in there and also to another organisation that's done some excellent work through ILC grants, um, which is Rights and Inclusion Australia. So, yeah, hopefully that's that's useful. Um, it's, yeah, not exhaustively responding to everything, but it's, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to join today. I do need to um, rush off to another forum, but. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming, Siobhan. Thank you very much. Um, I will just, just, read, just before yes. you go, uh, uh, I think uh, we're very much a silent minority and we don't have enough numbers, but I do think political protests and rallies are very effective. And I think we should get a whole lot of people to march on Canberra and get uh, Mr Albanese to address the problem um, and also get uh, Peter... Dutton to uh, address us and see what uh, muscle we can flex in. Yeah, look, I think that's one of the themes that comes out of, you know, that disappointing response. The yeah. disability community is resilient and a resourceful and determined. And, you know, as much as it's, yeah, a shame that we've had to go through, yeah, so, so much in terms of so many people putting so much into the DRC and hoping that it would de deliver solutions. And it's a shame that we have to keep pushing, but I'm I'm pretty sure there are a lot of, you know, advocates and people with disability out there who are up for that fight and to keep keep calling yeah. for the, that change that needs to happen. Mm. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Siobhan. Siobhan's put some really great links in the chat, which Godana will send mm. out afterwards yeah. summer foundation is where i get a lot of my information about housing they're amazing um yeah. so our to your point david we'll be having specifically on housing which i think is accessible housing as sarah lynn you, you raised is a huge issue that we probably we can speak up for now so we'll be having our first um campaign meeting to look at how we promote this and we will be doing it collaboratively with other organizations like PDCN um, who we work closely with and building better homes campaign is another link in here which SCIA is a member of so we've been supporting building better home cam homes campaign for a long time um, but yes the campaign could involve marching um, Ooh, and speaking excellent. and speaking of um, accessible housing is, is a really important um, a really important press, issue for us and New South Wales in particular very well and I think the general public would too. So we mm -hmm. just got to get get it out there. It's I mean we're we're hidden from the general public, and no one talks about it. And you know I just think it's a way of doing it. Definitely. And other organisations. We did go to. Um, I see Wayne's here. We did go to our New South Wales Parliament House. Um, mm. a couple of uh, months ago now or a month ago um, yep. to speak up on this issue for New South Wales. Um, SCIA yep. was there. Um, and, um, so is it a state or a federal issue? The um, not adopting the silver standards is a state, a state. issue. So New South oh, Wales okay. has not signed up to these standards, mm. which means that we are not <coughs> mandating new builds mm. being to be accessible at this stage in yeah. New South Wales. Well, they've, they've got plenty of money. They're relatively well off. <laughs> 
Yes, and as demonstrated in the policy briefing, that's not a high cost. Um, yeah. So no. there's a lot of links in there. I hope everyone didn't find that too overwhelming, um, but it was great for, to hear from Siobhan Dana do a lot of work in this space. Um, speaking up, they are really, they're, they're everywhere. Um, yep. So I thought it'd be quite, we thought it'd be quite interesting to hear what they're doing. Um, and please feel free to follow some of these links um, and raise some of these issues as well um, with Gordana and I, if you want to follow them up. Okay, um, Sarah Jane is asking. Yeah, thanks, Cordana um, and Susie. Just on the backside of some of these comments about um, getting up in, in Canberra, I'm, I'm actually about to have a meeting with my local council tomorrow um, and getting the opportunity to speak about this stuff on behalf of the community. But one of my suggestions, I'm taking a, um, I've got a spare wheelchair and I'm taking it with me. And one of the exercises in the workshop is to go on a trip around my local village. And I wonder, you know, that that could be a little mm. gimmicky thing that could be implemented into those that are making the decisions. Please go and see if you can visit your friend or go yep. and grab yourself some lunch. I think mm. that sort of thing is quite powerful. Yes. Absolutely. Well, and I think, yeah, Ali, well done, SJ. I think we great. Not disability is wheelchair related, but it's, I guess, iconic in a way. Yeah. 100%. And it was something that I think Ali mentioned in the chat as well. Um, visiting friends and family. It's about being yep. part of your community. It's not just your own house. Yep. Yeah. Just on that, SJ, um, we had a disability day here in Orange and um, we've got all the councillors uh, in wheelchairs and said, you know, because most of the footpaths are not accessible here in Orange. And um, we said, you know, go and try and cross the road, um, you know, um, go down to the park, you know, travel in the wheelchairs, sit in them for, you know, half an hour, 20 minutes. Me and um, Dr. Steve Peterson, you know, that, that you might know in the wheelchair as well, um, you know, we took them around here and, yeah, they sort of opened their eyes up once they were living or not mm -hmm. living, but um in our shoes for you know half an hour 40 minutes to see how accessible it is um yeah. and with those ramps um we're trying to get those ramps here in orange in most of the shops because um no shops are accessible really unless yeah. you're in in the mall or places like that just yeah and when you response. sorry susie you go. no I was just going to um, say, when you get into regional areas like Orange Rex, it's, it's, shops are even less accessible, aren't they? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I might have mentioned it in a forum before, and Rex, that's such a great point. Um, for years now, and I've never had the gumption to do it, but I feel like it's building momentum, just a, a campaign that I thought I would begin in my local LGA called the Ramp It Up, you know, kick the yep. step for what, you know, coin the term kick the step ramp it up and every shop gets a like the old breastfeeding stickers breastfeeding welcome here you get a, a symbol for the wheelchair and maybe a doorbell if you have you know that and, and then there's some kind of big big pilot that happens in an area and then it can spread that's something that I feel that I want to get some leg, legs on for want of a better term. They, um, Sarah and Rex they're, they're great um advocacy that you're doing for the community. I often think that um, because people with disabilities are seen in the minority, even though 22% of the population have disabilities, it's to, it would be beneficial to help people um, realise that accessibility improves the lives of everyone. And mm -hmm. so getting counsellors not only in a wheelchair but also with a pram um, another counsellor with a pram with um, a couple of kids in there or pretend kids that are very heavy and shopping and trying to get from one end of the city to the next. And then another person with a huge heavy suitcase that's trying to get to the local railway station so they can go to the airport and catch a plane. Another person who's got a big trolley of 100 water bottles that they have to deliver to the local shop and how they get across to one end of the city to the others to deliver all to those local shops. And, you know, there's lots of examples. Um, and when I've spoken to people about accessibility, they just don't get it because it's not lived experience and also the fact that it's a minority and they think it will never affect them. And... Mm. 
they don't see it and yep. why do they have to put an effort into it. But when it affects everyday life of everybody, I think that's a better way to prove that accessibility is really important for the community. But well done on, on your work with local government because it's hard to get messages through to people and you just have to keep pounding away at it. Yeah. I was Thank just going to add, uh, Tanya uh, in her chat said, realistically, as people age in one way or another, um, some sort of um, home modification will be required to maintain independence and safety. The other aspect to, the, to that is challenge people to not access businesses and buildings, parks, yeah. facilities that are not accessible for a full month. And she's saying 50% of more CBD is not accessible. So I think there's there's two ad, there's an advocacy issue here about uh, include that's why I wanted that inclusion minister minister for inclusion I was like come on um, to focus on these exact issues um, there's advocacy mm -hmm. issues here about accessible housing which we we'll continue to talk about um, and also just to note taking off my act. Um, my advocacy hat for a minute, SCIA also does run inclusion count training. Um, it's another part of our organisation where we do bring along wheelchairs if it's appropriate. Um, and we do run workshops for organisations to um, to learn about exactly like you're saying, Jane, the social model of disability and why it affects everybody and why it's not just people with disability who benefit and, and how you yeah. can do it for little or no cost, actually. So that yeah. is another, that is a part of SCIA. Can, Susie, can you do that out of um, like the Sydney-based area? Can we do it in like our local area? Mm. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. We offer the training um, in New South Wales and virtually at the moment. Um, yep. But yeah, Sarah Lynn, I mean, it's out of, outside of advocacy. I don't want to step from advocacy into inclusion. That's another part of the organisation. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> by all means, ring and, and have a chat to the team um, in inclusion if you would like to talk about it further. Definitely. Thank you. Just as you were speaking, everyone was speaking, I had a, a couple of ideas. Anthony Roberts um has been a strong advocate. He's in state um, parliament and he introduced the Everyone Can Play guidelines for accessible playgrounds. Yep. He, may, he may be someone who, um, and he knows myself and my my son, Evander, who has a spinal cord injury. And, yeah, he, he was um, one of the ones who, who really backed that with our support. Um, so he, he may be someone who might be able to go in and bat for you and, Yes, he, he would understand, you know, he has young sons who if you kind of say to him, you know, imagine your sons couldn't go on play, play dates because they couldn't access the houses of their friends. Like, yeah, mm. yeah, I think those sort of things would really resonate with him. Great Thank suggestion, you. Claire. That's a great suggestion. is going to be sending out next week probably um, mm. a, a, a invitation for people who are interested in accessible housing as a policy, as a campaign issue. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure Anthony Roberts is on the list of people to approach yes, um, yeah. as well as other organisations, you know, Building Better Homes has been doing this for a long time. So we don't want to just fly solo. We'll be doing it with other organisations. Um, but yeah, if you're interested or if anyone here is interested, well, we when we wind up on housing, please join that. This one is about there's obviously there are so many things going on at the moment. Yep. Like it's it's crazy in, in my inbox every five minutes is um, registration task force, NDIS review, dis disability rule, um, you know, DRC. Um, then there's aged care as well. There are so many things going on at the moment. But we thought that this would be a really important one um, for you guys to be aware of. Um, some of you probably are uh, across the NDIS um, final report and then um, the new legislation. Obviously, the final report's been out for a long time, but the new legislation. Um, so we're just going to share the most... Um, the information that we have now and obvious I think anyone who is an NDIS participant I think today might have received an email um, with some information about the changes so I'll just go through I've, I've got to read it because it's all still quite new to me as well so that's why I look, keep looking over like this um, so obviously we know last year there was the NDIS final report um, we had you know 3939 actions and it was a focus on sustainability and fairness. One of the government responses was to introduce the NDIS bill, which became an act last week or the week before, um, and will be effective from the 3rd of October. Um, so some of the changes will start on the 3rd of October, and some of them will impact us a little bit. Um, so it's important to get across them. Um, 
Like the review, the government says that the act has been designed to promote fairness and sustainability. Um, and a lot of the changes do just put into place some of the things that have already been going on, um, promote, um, you know, have an emphasis on fraud reduction, et cetera, which of course we all want. But some of the, um, some of the changes I think will potentially have an impact on people who receive NDIS support. Um, and also we will need to really get across the detail to make sure that where um, people, everyone understands the different processes and the new rules. So the space to keep advocating the NDIS bill is just one piece of the puzzle and there's the rules are what makes most of the changes and they come underneath and they're still part of a consultation process. Um, but the other thing is getting across the data. So the big things that are changing immediately on the 3rd of October, um, I think someone might have, I'm just going to mute um, everyone. Um, the big things, the definition of an NDIS support. So I actually, we actually wrote a submission on this and you can find it on our, um, on our website, on the SCIA website under submissions. Um, so until now, we've relied on the idea of um, reasonable and necessary supports. So That's a term that anyone who uses the NDIS, you guys would all know about. Um, to um, And the support needs to uh, meet participant goals, help independence, enable participation, um, and it ha can't be a support that can be delivered by another um, another department. But now what they've done is they've actually created a list, which is a bunch of uh, supports that are in and a bunch of supports that are out, essentially. So it's a list of supports. Um, and it, they say the list is for people to understand how to spend their money. Um, it's a temporary list. There'll be a list developed at a later date, which means, it, and it will be in the rules of the legislation. Um, so it means if the list that they've developed right now doesn't work well, there is space for us to advocate for change. Um, so from the 3rd of October, you can only be funded by for supports that are on the in list. Um, and a lot of this list is non-controversial, you know, things like crystal therapy and things that, you know, you would expect not to be on the in list. Um, but there's a couple of things when I read it, and that was in our submission, um, that maybe may affect our members. The one that I highlighted of, of most concern um, is that mainstream community engagement is on the out list. So what that would mean is um, if you had a goal to, say, go back to the gym, um, if you were participating in Neuromoves or an a, a, a gym service like Neuromoves, a specialist disability gym, that would be on the in list. But if you just wanted to go to a mainstream gym, that actually is on the out list. Um, similarly, you know, we often in our in resilience programs encourage people to reconnect with past past past, um, past um, activities and hobbies. Um, so something like sailing, participating in an a sailing club that wasn't disability specific, that then is on the out list. Um, so that I think is a, no one wants to be channeled if they if they don't need to be into a specialist disability service. Um, and that idea of segregation is flies in the face of the Disability Royal Commission as well. So to me, when I read that, and I know a lot of other advocacy organisations um, have raised this as well, it's, it's a bit of a risk. It doesn't mean that there is an exemption. There's always an exemption um, and there is a form that you can fill in to, I think if it's, um, if it, if it's cheaper and um, you can demonstrate more effective, um, um, then it can be considered, but it's only considered. So that's something that we have written a submission on um, and I know that it's being considered, but with the legislation passing at the moment, the list is um, that, that is on the out list, any of the main, any mainstream supports. Another sort of risky thing that's on the out list is um, ha standard household items. So on the surface, that's quite reasonable. You know, if, you, if you're just going to buy something for your kitchen um, or a standard household item, then, then that's something that everyone has to buy. But there are things that might be pieces of assistive technology that would then be on the out list. And I'm thinking the example I've heard people using is something like a Thermomix. Um, if people need to use that to prepare food, um, that at the moment is just a standard piece of household equipment. So again, um, you can apply for an exemption if it's cheaper 
and it's more effective, then it can be considered. But we, I think, need to know how to apply for that exemption so that people understand um, and are not, you know, finding that they're actually applying for things on the out list so that it doesn't have a negative impact on people. Now, these changes are not going to be applied to existing plans. Anyone who's got a plan that has some kind of participation goal that is now on the out list, that's okay. It's only on new plans that this is going to be implemented. Um, so it, we've got a little bit of time to get our heads around how to do the forms and that kind of thing. Another change that I think needs to be flagged that I came across in a forum a couple of weeks ago is the words solely and directly on the out list. So the, the words on the out list, um, on the in list, sorry, additional living costs that are incurred for a participant solely and directly as a result of their disability support needs. Um, and that means if it's, if it's mostly for disability support needs, but it also might be used by a partner or by someone else, then it would be excluded from the list. The example in the forum that I attended was an air conditioner where someone had an air conditioner and they also used it because it was hot in summer, even though they also they used it for temperature regulation. Because they weren't solely using it for their disability, then that becomes something that is excluded. So again, it's not that it's not that it will necessarily be excluded, but we really need to understand how to phrase this when people are writing, um, preparing their plans. Um, Rex, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just um, when you say new plans, is that like for new customers that or new um, participants that come on, or is that when you plan? Renewal. Re like, it's. Yeah, it's for when you're starting a new plan. So, yeah. so not just for new participants, but for anyone who's going starting the plan process. So it's not for an existing plan, but any renewal. Yeah. Right. Okay then. So even though this bill um, allows for longer plans, which will be helpful, the other thing that you'll see that's changing immediately is that funds can be released slowly over the course. It will be released slowly over the course of the plan. So if you have SIL accommodation, um, they'll make sure that's released to cover that so this is where they're really trying to make up any overspends that they you know the, the savings that they're talking about through the legislation however we know that when in in case of our community most of the any overspending comes from a change in circumstances like a change in health conditions or um, a change in living arrangements so there is and it's really important to know um, that even though overspends they're talking about raising debts and they're talking about not allowing people to spend more than their plan there is a change in circumstances form still so it's really important to know where to find that um, and that additional cost, costs incurred um, through change of circumstances can still be um, be used if you're filling it. Just we need to make sure we find that form and that mechanism to do that. Um, so I don't think at this stage we need to think too much about the recovering debt, but that is the ultimate goal: is to make sure that anything that that any you're only buying thing or using things on the in list and anything on the out list actually won't be approved and there'll be a debt. So we need to make sure we understand these in and out lists. Now, an email went out today, I think, um, to NDIS participants, or at least it's going out this week, um, about these changes, um, Section 33 and S33 and S10, um, which is how the funding can be used and what you can spend it on, the lists that we're talking about. Um, and the, the language, I read the email this afternoon, and the language is very much like, we will walk you through this. We're not going to start like incurring, people aren't going to start incurring debts immediately. Um, I don't think there's ill intent in this legislation um, from my reading. It's just that there are things that maybe haven't been very well thought through because it's done been done really quickly. So I don't think the legislation changes are there to catch people or, or, or incur debts and get money back. It's more that I think sometimes we'll need to be very, very aware of how to write the plans and, and apply for the plans, um, utilising the knowledge that we have, like the, what exemptions, how to fill out these forms, et cetera. So next steps, I'm still learning about this. I am attending so many forums and meetings to make sure I can give you the most up-to-date information um, and understand the detail. So it's, it's really being rolled out now. 
Um, what we're thinking we'll do, we've been talking with um, our other teams in the, in the organization, is at the very beginning of 2025, once we know all the detail, we'll hold some information sessions for people who are, you know, doing plan renewals um, to make sure everyone knows about all the different exemptions and how to apply for them and the language and that kind of thing. Um, and the other thing um, we'll be doing is looking at foundational supports. I'm attending a workshop on Friday to understand these foundational supports that people are talking about. That's the other part of some of the changes that are coming through that might fill the gap of what's on the out list. I'm not sure at this stage. Um, we, I think at least, that there's a huge role for training because the NDIS is saying this is what we do already, but we've got navigators coming in and we need people to understand um, what exemptions and, and, and understand why this assistive technology is important. So SCI has done some work in the past in doing training about spinal cord injury with um, the NDIS and we'll be advocating to be doing that again. So they're the changes that are coming immediately. I don't think anyone needs to panic because it's not retrospectively applied to plans, but it is something we need to familiarise ourselves with over the next month. So I'll be working on information sheets to send out to people. I'll be attending all the forums so I can provide updates in, our, in the meetings like this. And we'll be having some information sessions in early 2025 when we feel like as an advocacy team, we understand all the information as well. But look out for the emails if you're an NDIS participant. Also, you can go to their website for a summary of the changes. Um, I think Tanya has also, yep, um, a link to the website. So that was well-timed. Um, that you can also go to the website where it explains the changes. Um, and if you don't receive an email and you are an NDIS participant, then um, make sure you do follow up with them. So that's what I've got on the amendment and the bill today. Does anyone have any questions? And I'll do my best to answer. I'm still learning too. How many changes are there, Susie, on the in and the out list? Um, we've never had a list before. So it's right. more that um, in the past, it was just reasonable and necessary. There has been a list that, that's floated around, but it was never, uh, never applied. Um, and it was under dispute between the federal and state governments, but there's never been a list. Previously, it had to just be assessed as reasonable and necessary, beneficial for participation and community engagement. This is what the NDIS is saying is in the review they heard, and this, this what did come up in the review, that people were confused about what they were allowed to spend their money on. And that might not be people in our community, that might be people um, you know, in intellectual disability who weren't sure what they could spend um, their, their funds on. So this is supposed to really set it, make it clear. I think the risk for us though is there's a few things on that out list that we don't necessarily think should be on the out list and that's where we wrote our submission and that's where we'll continue advocating. Um, but we, as long as we know how to use the exemptions um, and can explain and it's cost neutral, um, we should still be able to apply for things on the out list if we can demonstrate that they are reasonable and necessary. Just a quick one. Would um. So when, when like, I know star goods has been a big thing for me, um, will that be still something available for NDIS participants um, to be able to access that? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But so I think my understanding is if your holiday was somewhere else, um, well, no, holidays isn't a good example, but it's no. more mainstream. Um, yeah. services like gyms, community centres, activities um, yeah. that are currently on the out list. Okay, perfect. Because I really think I've got a really big passion for Sargood and trying spinal life in a couple of weeks. And it, it, it's been a big turnaround for me, like, because obviously you guys know I didn't go to rehab. So I've learnt so much and I would hate that mm. a place like that that gives us so much mm. um, could then be jeopardised. Be fine. Yeah, no, that will still be, that's still on our in list. Awesome, in -list. thanks, Izzy. Sarah Jane. I, I've just got a question about that specifically. If um, you need to specifically have F STA in your budget, you know, that that's because it's challenging to get STA even under circumstances that scream its need. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what the situation is there. I don't think there's any changes specifically to STA that I know of. Um, what I think is, is is a risk is educating the new navigators in the system yeah. um, so that people understand the why. 
Um, so I think that's where we will need to focus our advocacy is explaining the why, because that's, as you say, it's an existing problem. Mm. Yeah. Well, and just happy to help anyway. Just in, in context mm. of a woman with quadriplegia who lives on their own and their carers get sick and go away or they've got something going on in their home that they can't live there, there's no other option. You need somewhere to go. And um, and that's, I had a plan review and that still wasn't granted. So I mm. don't quite know how much else to say, really. Yeah, I think, I think we all need to kind of stand up and go, yep, this yep. is why it's important for us and like really fight for it because it's, it is a big, it's a life changing SJ. <clears throat> like I've seen you down there, you know, you've seen me down there and I think mm. that so many people, I wish that more people knew about it and I wish it was available for more people. You know, I said that idea of appeal it to a support coordinator and they, um, shone a light on the idea of being careful of potentially a review losing you funding because they will scrutinise further. So it's a real, oh, God, what do you do? No, no, ignore that. That's, that's just the care of looking after themselves. Mm. And I, I actually did an appeal in conjunction with a, a carer and I sacked her halfway through it and I did it myself. And then that failed. So then we went to the tribunal and they they didn't we didn't even go into the courthouse they they just settled you know straight away gave me everything i was after mm. and that was the end of the story because it's more trouble than it's worth to mm. go to court over and expense yes that's true and when you look at the the rate of complaints that they were talking about which is why you know they they've they've got the yeah it's just really interesting so i don't think they want to go down that path either if they can avoid it all right so we'll just go to our next section which is about um, for me to introduce you to our advocacy advisory group so we've got 11 people on our advisory group uh, some of which are actually here today so I'm actually going to um, go through and just get people to put their cameras on and give everybody a bit of a wave when I call out your name and I call out the area that you're actually going to be setting up your networks in. The first person I've got here is um, David L and John Green. Do you guys want to just open up your cameras and just say hello to everybody? And these guys are actually going to set up a, an activated network in the Taree area. So um, have we got... <laughs> David's waving. David's got the coolest okay. white headphones. That's okay. Okay, then we've got David Ham, who's in the Wagga Wagga area. So, David, hi. Uh, hello. <laughs> we've got uh, Jeanette. Yeah. Sorry? I'm sitting in my car, as you may realise, and um, <laughs> I'm, apologies for getting here so late, but I do feel it's something that's uh, very necessary in Wagga and Tumut. Okay, beautiful. And we are, we're actually going to go for a, probably a 100-kilometre um, a radius around Wagga Wagga to pick up um, people from different towns oh, yes. that are in that area. Well, that's, that, that's just how it is. <laughs> yes. The Shire is that big, yeah. Yeah, true. Um, so then we got Jeanette Bond, who's actually not with us here today, and Raja. And uh, we're, with me, they're going to set up a group in the eastern yeah. suburbs. So we're either going to, I think what we're looking at at the moment is either a couple of times in the Sutherland Shire area and then a couple of times in the Eastern Sydney um, area as well. Um, so Ali Cook, yeah, there's Ali. Hi, Ali. And Ali's going to set up in the Illawarra Shoalhaven. Um, so uh, Ali lives in the Shoalhaven area. So we're going to be doing the same thing. We're going to go probably 100 um, kilometre radius just to pick up people in the outlining towns as well. Sarah Jane. So Sarah Jane's going to set up a group in the Blue Mountains. Uh, Sarah Jane also works as a peer support worker for Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. So it'll be a combination of peer support and um, and an activated network at the same time. And we've got a couple of others that we're looking at doing this with as well. Okay, uh, Jane Broadman. Hi, Jane. Jane's actually in the Hi, Parramatta everyone. area. And then we've got Sarah Lynn as well. So Sarah Lynn's actually in the Port Macquarie area. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi there. Fantastic. And Tanya. So Tanya is um, Tanya is in the Moree area. So she'll be setting up a group there and we'll be doing the same. We'll do um, quite a, a, 
you know, some kilometres outside of Moree to try and pick up the outlining people in that area. And then we've got another group that we're setting up in Canberra, and that's with a gentleman called Jordan um, Cramp. Um, and I can't remember the name of the organisation that um, that's in Canberra. <laughs> we can't remember. It's something oh, spinal. Dear. It's, it's spinal, spinal ACT. It's spinal ACT. Spinal, yeah, spinal ACT, spinal ACT. Is, the, um, is the volunteer group that's actually yeah. going to be managing this. So they're doing a combination of peer support and also the um, activated community network in their area. And we're doing a launch for them on the 12th of October. So I'm going to put something in the Dear Fellow Advocates um, email for you guys if you want to come to the launch. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's basically our group and it's really fantastic. So the Activated Community Networks, um, these guys are actually establishing those networks in, in the areas that we've just talked about. And then we're going to, we're also, we've also been working on the promotional material uh, around this and also having discussions around how this could, these could look in the different areas that, that we're talking about. So we are getting there and most of them are looking at starting probably in um, from February next year onwards. So just I'll keep um, promoting them through the e-newsletters that I send through and also through the um, Spinal Cord Injuries Australia newsletters as well.